I hereby open this academic ceremony in which former Lavantina Henrika Maria Tönissen will defend the academic thesis challenges and opportunities of women in entrepreneurship, essays on motherhood and access to finance. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis? Thank you. Dear Prorector, uh, dear members of the Corona, dear colleagues, dear family, chers amis, I am happy to have the opportunity to share the findings of my work with you today. And I thank you all for being here with me. Je suis heureuse de pouvoir présenter ce moment particulier avec vous, et je vous remercie de votre présence. In my work, as the title above me indicates, I investigate the challenges and opportunities of women in entrepreneurship. Being an entrepreneur is never easy, regardless of whether you're a male or a female. However, to women, certain challenges are even more salient than for men. And those are the ones that I focus on in my research. Dans mon travail, comme l'indique le titre affiché au-dessus de moi, je me penche sur les défis et les opportunités des femmes entrepreneuses. Que l'on soit homme ou femme, être indépendant n'est facile pour personne. Cependant, certains défis sont encore plus prononcés pour les femmes, comparés aux hommes. Et ce sont ces défis particuliers sur lesquels je me concentre dans ma recherche. The European Union identified five challenges to female entrepreneurship that need to be addressed in order to encourage more women to start their business. These are access to information, access to finance, training, reconciling business and family concerns, and access to networks for business purposes. I concentrate on two of these challenges, access to finance and reconciling business and family. When starting your own business, regardless of whether you acquire an existing business or it is a new one, the adventure will start with a need for money. Traditionally, when entrepreneurs seek financial resources, they will follow the, the so-called life cycle. The smaller, younger firms will start with personal loans, credit card debt, and money received from the three Fs, friends, family, and fools. As firms mature and grow, the first revenues arrive. At this stage of the life cycle, the lion's share of entrepreneurs will turn to the bank and ask for a business loan. Requesting a loan entails meeting the loan officer, defending the business idea, and explaining what the money will be used for. In this conversation, or rather negotiation, for the loan between the bank officer and the entrepreneur, women are found to be less assertive than men. Women find it difficult to sell their business idea and difficult to ask for money. As a result, female entrepreneurs are not only less likely than males to obtain the necessary loan, but if they obtain it, women will pay higher interest rates and provide more guarantees compared to men. This renders access to finance much more burdensome for women than for men. I now turn to the second challenge, reconciling business and family concerns. In most families, childcare and household responsibility still lies with mothers, whereas men are perceived to be the primary breadwinners. Well, luckily, we see a slow but steady evolution in this trend compared to earlier generations. But in many households, it is often the mother who will adapt her working schedule and career prospects to accommodate the family obligations. Often, with young children at home, mothers are the one taking parental leave, turning to part-time employment, or choosing an occupation that allows for more flexible working schedules. These choices will hinder their career prospects too. In my work, I look at two possible opportunities through which women in entrepreneurship can address these challenges. The first is crowdfunding. The mechanism of crowdfunding is as follows. On one side, you have a large group of people called the crowd. On the other side, you have the individual that seeks to finance. 
through the website of an internet-based company, which is called a crowdfunding platform. Individuals can directly address the crowd and request for a loan. The particularity of such platforms is that there is no intermediary involved, compared to, for example, the bank loan officer I referred to earlier. On the internet page of the platform, borrowers indicate the purpose of the loan, the amount of money they wish to borrow, and the conditions under which they will repay the lender. If the crowd deems the investment worth it, this large group of investors will provide individually small amounts of money until they reach the total amount requested by the borrower. Crowdfunding platforms are open to everyone, and lenders can decide themselves to whom they wish to lend their money. As such, they share the decision whether or not an entrepreneur is deemed credit worthy. I will return to the mechanism of crowdfunding later with an example. The second opportunity I investigate is mompreneurship. Worldwide, the highest participation rates in starting a business are found with women under 35 years of age. This coincides with the age at which women become mothers and shows how interlinked motherhood can be with the decision to become an entrepreneur. Mompreneurs deliberately choose to start up a business when they need to care for their young children. Being a mompreneur offers the opportunity to earn income from work, to find an occupation that one likes, and offers the flexibility to be your own boss. Most businesses started by mompreneurs are home-based and heavily rely on internet sales. This makes it a particularly attractive alternative for wage employment, especially in terms of the flexibility of working schedules. Together with my colleagues, we asked ourselves whether parental leave policies have an impact on mother's decision to become a mompreneur. After all, parental leave schemes are precisely designed to help mothers in this combination between family and work by offering a period of job protection and income when caring for young children. To answer this question, I looked at Germany. Before 2001, Germany had among the most generous parental leave schemes in the world, offering no less than three years of job protection and paid leave to young mothers. Starting in 2001, this generous scheme was reduced to only one year of paid leave. This is quite a change. And I expected that it would also influence the mother's choice to become a mompreneur. And it did. It seems that a period of parental leave allows mothers to rethink their careers and possibly think well, whether or not to start their own business. Reducing the time of parental leave will then also reduce the time available to think and reflect, and less mothers will become mompreneurs. Now, Let's say that the mother indeed chose to become a mompreneur in order to combine childcare responsibilities with a professional occupation. The next question we asked ourselves is what happens when the kids grow up? The most demanding and time-consuming period of motherhood in terms of childcare are the early childhood years. Often, once the kids reach primary school age, things get a bit easier. This milestone can also be a moment when a mother has more latitude to combine childcare responsibilities with wage employment. So I looked at exactly that. I compared three groups of mothers, those that stayed in wage employment after childbirth, mothers that were mompreneurs after childbirth, and mothers that stayed home after childbirth. Then I looked at what happened to the salaries of these moms when the children of these mothers reached a primary school age. What I found out is that moms that stayed in employment earned higher salaries than moms that stayed at home. But for the mompreneurs, they did not earn more than mothers that stayed home until the kids reached primary school age. Apparently, in terms of financial rewards, employers do not compensate mothers for having self-employment experience. There is, however, also good news for mothers that chose to become entrepreneurs. Once their kids go to school, these mothers have a higher chance to be in wage employment compared to mothers who stayed home with the children during that same period. Employers do reward self-employment experience and can interpret this as a positive signal of willingness to work. 
And even if it does not lead to a higher wage, mompreneurship is an opportunity to reconcile business and family obligations with positive consequences for modern careers. I will now return to my crowdfunding uh, story I told earlier. I think the best way to explain the setup of my research in this respect is to illustrate the mechanism at work with a small example. Imagine for a moment that this is the website of a crowdfunding platform. You are part of the crowd. You have a small amount of money that you would like to invest and you think of investing in a starting entrepreneur. On this platform, there are two campaigns available. The first entrepreneur has a doggy walk business. The loan amount requested is 15 euros. The entrepreneur offers an interest rate of 2% and will repay the loan in full six months from now. The second entrepreneur sells homemade lemonade to hiking tourists in the local area. The loan amount requested is slightly higher, 20 euros. The entrepreneur offers an interest rate of 2.5% and will repay the loan in full four months from now. What we do in our research is that we set the link between the gender of the entrepreneur, is it a female or a male entrepreneur, and the speed at which he or she obtained the requested funds from the crowd of investors. We find that female entrepreneurs receive the required loan approximately 20% faster than male entrepreneurs. So what message would I like you to take home today? As I just illustrated with my example, through crowdfunding, female entrepreneurs benefit from faster access to funds. The speed at which they obtain the funds is determined by the willingness to invest of many small individual investors, the crowd. I complement existing academic research by putting the spotlight on a large subset of female entrepreneurs, mothers. I show that the time spent on parental leave can be used by mothers to rethink their career and start a business. I also find that mothers with self-employment experience may not earn more when returning to wage employment, but I have greater chances to be employed. Finally, the work done up to now also raised many new questions. And as a researcher, it is a never ending journey. Therefore, my plan in the coming years for my career is to deepen the knowledge about crowdfunding mechanism and think in what other ways digitalization can help women thrive in entrepreneurship. I thank you for your attention and I give the word back to the project. Merci de votre présentation. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by the chair of the assessment committee and professor of real estate finance here at Maastricht University, Niels Koch. Dear candidate, dear Paul, I'll, I'll stick to English if you don't mind. My French is a little, little rusty. It's great to be here in person and welcome to your, uh, your friends and family after COVID. But most of all, it's great to see you finally here at last with, with, this, uh, with this very nice dissertation. A dissertation that talks about uh, mompreneurs, not deadpreneurs, but still it, it feels kind of personal to me. And I know that it feels very personal to you um, as an entrepreneurial, uh, uh, hardworking mother. So, uh, so congratulations on, on delivering this, this book here. So in preparation for today's defense, I was, of course, reading some papers and I came across a paper from, from Lena Hip from Berlin University, and she did a, a study on, on parental leave and labor market access. And she summarized the issue of working mothers quite strongly. So I'm going to cite her. She says, these findings suggest that being a good worker and a good parent is possible for men, but not for women. Mothers can only do it wrong. They're punished either for being a poor worker or for being a poor parent. So I found that quite a striking uh, a sentence from her research. And uh, well, it, it, it comes to show how important it is to do, uh, to do this kind of research, but also to be vocal for, for, the, for the theme. So you focus on female entrepreneurship as a kind of a substitute for regular labor. 
in what I think are three interesting complementary chapters that together cover a wide range of issues, uh, focusing on, on policy shocks in, in, uh, in Germany and the effect on, on entrepreneurship, uh, crowdfunding, I thought was, was quite interesting, and then entrepreneurship and, and labor market re-entry. I also think that you did a good job in, in summarizing the findings for, for policymakers, and you just had, had some summary here, but I'm also wondering, what is the lesson, what are the lessons in your dissertation for the 3.9 billion women out there? So in my who knows, first question or main question, I'd like you to reflect uh, on your findings and translate these findings into advice for a 30-year-old woman that's thinking about children. So let's think about, let's say, Olivia, in about you know, 20 years, and make it a bit more personal. So what is the best employment strategy that she can follow? based on the findings in your chapters. Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you for your question. I think there, there are mainly two things that, that can come out of uh, the findings of my work. The first one is that personal decisions and labor market related decisions cannot be seen separately from each other. Um, the, the, the personal situation, the family situation, uh, the obligations and also the, the, the joy that comes with it um, are intrinsically linked. It is very hard to disentangle them. If um, women decide that um, the, the, the career path they will follow will influence their, fa their family situation, their family situation will also influence that career path. And it is a, a choice that will have short-term and long-term consequences. And this is one of the things I wanna show in the last chapter of my dissertation is that if mompreneurship is an option in the short term because it allows this flexibility, this choice of short term will also have long term effects. That's the first one. The second one is a matter of awareness. If I, I uh, reflect upon the statement that you've just made from the author, in which women can never do things right, uh, I think that is recognizable to many women, but I also think it's quite unfair because it's shows that we would not be capable of managing it all together. And I think that generations passing on, we are able now to manage these things together and that you can have a choice of an occupation that you do like, that is rewarding and that gives you the income that you would like. Um, and that would be also the advice I would like to give Olivia later on if she has to do her, her choice for her job. I hope I've answered your question. So, so, so entrepreneur or not entrepreneur why choose okay let's leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> the opposition will be continued by a member of the assessment committee and professor of labor economics at the university of waterloo laurie curtis you need to unmute laurie yep Thank you for inviting me to the ceremony. Uh, congratulations, Pom. It's um, a very interesting thesis. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it um, and I, I learned a lot, um, particularly about crowdfunding. But my question is going to mainly relate to chapters um, two and four. Um, and it, it goes back to the statement that you just made about sort of uh, labor market and family decisions. Um, being intrinsically linked. So you make a statement that time on parental leave offers women um, a, a unique a chance to develop business opportunities, explore new career paths, and reconcile business and family um, considerations in um, chapter two. And my question is about the, the um, policy implications of such a statement. Typically, parental leave policies um, are designed to promote family bonding, health, and well-being of the mother and child. 
and the and the entire family. And so if we think about promoting um, parental leave as a way to enhance um, business opportunities, might that have an, a negative impact um, on um, parental leave policies for women? Or um, how do you think about um, this promotion and um, the in interlinking of other employment policies? If Ali, esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, if you allow me, I'll try to rephrase it to see if I understood it correctly. Um, from what I understood, your question relates to the policy implications of parental leave. So whether the, the length of the leave, if it is seen as a tool for a business opportunity will not be detrimental to the original intention of the parental leave policy. Did I understand that correctly? Exactly, thank you. Um, fr from what, we, what I researched in, in the work that is done on, on the parental leave policies, um, I would call it a, a sort of a side effect, if not, not being negative or uh, to, to, to scale it down the finding, but um, parental leave is there indeed to ensure security for mothers and, and I'm def definitely uh, think it is a very good thing that in, in there is an availability of parental leave. Um, the only thing I highlight is that next to giving job security and income security, it might also have other effects that were not intended initially by policymakers. And one of those effects is that given the length of the time that is available, if that time is long enough, women might also reflect and rethink their career choices in that period because you then get, and it is a liminal phase in your life where a lot changes once, it, once the children are there. But next to that, it is also a moment that you can do a step back and think and see if there are other opportunities out there. There might be women, that also make other labor market choices in that same period. But that is something we did not look at. We only inferred whether or not it had an impact on the decision to become self-employed. Okay. I hope I've answered your question. Yes, thank you. Yes, the session will be continued by a member of the assessment committee and professor of corporate finance at the University of Antwerp, Mark Pillow. Okay, thank you, uh, dear Tom. First, my apologies for the fact that I can't be in Maastricht, which I intended to do, but unfortunately, I had to change my plans. Um, as uh, my colleagues already have said, it's really very interesting work that you have done. And uh, I have a question which is also about the second chapter, because, I mean, this is a very important topic. So um, it was very interesting to read. Um, and my question is that, well, you seem to assume throughout this chapter that mompreneurship, as you call it, is good and reflects a positive choice of the mother, inspired by the fact that uh, the, 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 the facts that women become mother gives them time to reflect about a future career. But um, I was wondering, uh, couldn't there also not be a negative explanation for your finding that mompreneurship increases um, after the events? Um, well, we know that entrepreneurship creates uncertainty. Uh, often it implies harder work and worse pay than regular employment. And I noticed that an important part of the business that you categorize as entrepreneurial activity is actually freelance work, which from a long-term perspective could be considered uh, a bad choice. So I was wondering, could it not be that at least to some extent, models choosing entrepreneurship do this because they have to do this? Because uh, for example, 
uh, a longer parental leave makes it harder for them to pick up their career again. So my question basically boils down to, can you convince me that mompreneurship is a positive choice and not a negative choice? Ali esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. If you allow me, I will uh, relate your question to the push-pull debate in entrepreneurship. So the decision whether or not uh, an individual is attracted into entrepreneurship out of opportunities, or whether an individual is, is uh, pushed in there out of necessity because of lack of better alternatives, for example. Um, One of the, the, the intentions and one of the policies that has come up with the European Union is that it is not only uh, mothers or females that would be better off if we have more self-employed individu self individuals, but society as a whole. So the, the externalities linked to self-employment go much further and are much broader than at the individual level of a mother. Unfortunately, what we cannot do and what we don't see in our study is whether what the alternatives for these mothers would have been. Uh, if the alternatives would have been to have uh, a high, high wage job and uh, a, ver a very good career, then one might argue that it might not be a good alternative. If the alternative would have been to stay at home and the individual not being happy with the fact of staying at home, then I'm not sure that mompreneurship is something bad. Unfortunately, it is not something that we can observe in the research as we conduct it. Um, from the perspective of the research that we have done, what we see is that for many of these mothers, the choice to be a mompreneur is not out of growth perspective or income perspective or with the intention to employ individuals. You refer to the freelancers as, as being a bad choice. Um, what I also think is that for many of these mothers, this gives them the opportunity to stay connected to the labor market, to stay active and offers an opportunity to take care for the children. And that might be a short term option, but in that short term, that might work really well for them. I hope okay. I answered your question. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And the uh, our session will be continued by a member of the assessment committee and associate professor of entrepreneurship here at Maastricht University, Jolene Halbert. Dear candidate, dear Poma, uh, congratulations with the high quality of your thesis on a topic of such high societal and academic relevance. Um, my question has to do with proposition number three, and I'm hoping that one of your parents will read it out loud. That will be me then. Um, the wisdom of the crowd overcomes the discrimination towards female entrepreneurs that occurs in traditional loan markets. Thank you. Um, so you find that female entrepreneurs, they reach this required loan, loan amount faster than their male counterparts. So crowdfunding seems to not discriminate against female entrepreneurs like bank loan officers do. And you refer to this as the wisdom of the crowd which to me was a very interesting concept. And I think it actually deserves a lot more uh, investigation in the future. Of course, you didn't have the data at this point to investigate more, but suppose in a follow-up study, you would dig into this and really want to understand why the crowd apparently judges female entrepreneurs differently than bank loan officers. How would you do this? And where would you start? Esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, as a matter of fact, this is one of the projects I have uh, with two of my colleagues, Bin and, and Peyran. Um, our intention is uh, to set up in an experimental setting and see if, in, if indeed, and especially what the mechanics are, so how 
this wisdom of the crowd works. Um, what, what is known up to now is that in situations of uncertainty, investors have the tendency to mimic the behavior of other investors. So they infer information from the behaviors of others. On those crowdfunding platforms, given that in real time, the investors can see how many pledges are already done on, on their different campaigns, they can infer and, and so to say free ride on that information and follow the behavior of the other investors, which is also what we call herding. The question then remains whether that herding is something positive or something negative. It might also attract investors into a campaign, which is not that interesting. But still, even though what we see is that the information available by many individuals and themselves aggregated is probably more informative than, for example, the information that the single loan officer, the officer will have at the bank. In that respect, we can see that the wisdom of the crowd actually is very informative and offers an advantage for female entrepreneurs. All right, thank you. The opposition will be continued by Professor in Data Science for Business and Economics at Maastricht University, Alexander Gregoriev. Dear candidate, dear Pomer, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Thanks a lot for the thesis. Really nice work. Um, I have two questions. One is childish, uh, a little bit non-serious. Um, and I like actually the exercise for the paranyms. May I, a paranym to your right? Um, well, please, uh, Yap, can you show to the audience the cover page of the thesis? Front page. Yeah, front page. Oh. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's gone from the screen. And now, Poma, this is a little exercise, warming up exercise for you. Um, actually, I'm curious, what is in common uh, between the women in entrepreneurship and an electronic circuit board schematic that is on your cover page? <laughs> Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. <laughs> um, first of all, if, if you allow me to translate your question, because there is someone in the audience which is very much concerned by this. Mika, c'est pour toi. Mikael is the one who, who designed uh, the cover. So he's, he's Elias Godfather, and he, he, in all the important stages of my life, he always designed everything and yeah, it was normal that he would always, that he was also uh, designed this one. Um, to answer your question, um, the relationship I can see is very much related to the answer I provided earlier, is the interlinkages between family and having children and decisions that you would take, your labor market decisions that you would take as a woman. They cannot be seen independently from each other. Oh, wow. Um, thank you. Now a serious one, serious and technical. Um, well, from the previous questions, uh, you might realize already that uh, we are really thinking that um, your thesis is full of the ideas for the policy design for policy making, right? And uh, in many occasions, you address it. Uh, in several chapters, in some chapters, you address it uh, in more details, in some chapters, you address it in less details. And uh, well, actually, well, you can pick up any chapter. So my question is quite general, it's generic one. So uh, pick up any chapter that you want to consider to address my question. Uh, I'm a sim simple-minded mathematician. I like always somewhat addressing questions, how many, how much, uh, where to, where from. So very simple-minded questions. Uh, and actually, when I, I was reading your thesis, I was quite curious, 
what type so if you are in the policy design mood so if if you want to address very specific question for instance in in chapter one or chapter two sorry uh you would address a question how long should be paid parental leave or in chapter uh three it would be something to do with the crowdfunding so i'll pick up a, a chapter and then i'm curious what type of social welfare functions just describe in general words, uh, in general words, uh, what type of uh, social welfare functions would you consider to be suitable in order to design a policy? And when you pick up such a function, can you a little bit speculate, are you able to actually get numeric results? Like for instance, how long should this paid parental leave be? You can, well, the second part you can omit if you find it uh, too difficult, but the first part about the types of the social welfare, uh, welfare functions, please address. Thanks. Alistina Ponen, thank you for your question. I think the mere difficulty uh, in your question and in the answer uh, that you expect from me, um, if I had known, I would have written it down. <laughs> um, the difficulty is that um, policies designed to enhance entrepreneurship have different layers. We could say it that way. Policy designed for entrepreneurship in general often miss the female target. Policy designed and really focusing on females often miss the target that there are consequences on those decisions related to the parental leave uh, question that, that Dr. Curtis asked earlier. Um, how would you solve this? I think the best way to solve it is if ability to raise awareness in general. Awareness of the structural biases that are present in the markets toward women. Uh, for example, the funding decisions that we talked about earlier, like uh, the opportunity that crowdfunding now gives, it helps solve it, but it's not a one size fits all, unfortunately. Um, removing barriers to entry, um, administrative burdens that are there, entry costs, and any conditions to obtain uh, starting grants, for example, are also one size fits all for entrepreneurs. Um, so in terms of your question, how many, how long? Again, I, I cannot provide you an answer to that. What I would like to give a shot is how, how would I tackle that? Um, I think the best way, first of all, is to make sure that there are mixed teams of policymakers that policy is um, set up, created, thought through by men, women, and all layers of society. And if you would mix that and make sure that everybody would give, have the opportunity to give their, their view on things, policy would be much more accurate and much more efficient in helping women to start up their businesses. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by a senior researcher at the Research Center of Education and the Labor Market, uh, Sanne van Wetten. Dear candidate, dear Pome, uh, also my congratulations on your uh, very, very, very wonderful thesis. Um, my question is a general question. It's about the context of your studies. So two of your studies uh, make use of data out of Germany, and one of your study uh, makes use of data out of the Netherlands. And you um, quickly touch upon it in chapter five that yeah, there are cultural concerns, uh, but I would like to invite you to reflect a bit more on this and what uh, the context of these studies mean for the generalizability of your results. Esteemed opponent, 
Thank you for your question. Germany is indeed one of the countries with the most generous um, um, social security network, I would call it that way, for families and for women in general. Um, if you would compare it to, for example, a country like the United States, where it is not that much present. This is a concern uh, we, we talked over with, uh, with co-authors as well. Um, and we decided that if anything, if we can already find an, an impact for changes in policy for a country like Germany, where in general propensity to be self-employed by women is very, very low, um, if anything, if we could uh, apply our findings to other countries, we hope that the effect would, would be larger and, and more efficient and have more impact. And that in these cultures, um, changes would be more impactful and that in, in these cultures, changes will have also heavier consequences for society at all. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And the opposition will be continued by Professor of International Economics, Mark Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, dear Pullman. Um, let me start by also congratulating you on an excellent thesis. I have to say, I'm really impressed by your ability to dance with the rain while there's a perfect storm raging in your personal life. Really brilliant. Um, and I'm also very pleased, of course, that you write, you chose to write on the topic of entrepreneurship. Um, it's an important topic. It's close to my heart. Um, and in the same room, not so long ago, I've advocated that a more entrepreneurial society is pretty much the solution to all our problems. Um, and you add to this the very important perspective of women, uh, which I didn't, so that's very good. Um, and of course, I, I agree that the entrepreneurial society should be inclusive. Um, uh, I, and, and for that, you also deserve a compliment for bringing an all male set of parents dressed up in, in dresses. That's also uh, worthy of a compliment. Um, but um, now seriously, um, I wholeheartedly agree. Let me say that first, that all women that want to become entrepreneurs should have access to the knowledge, the capital and the labor that they need to do so. And they should have that access on the same terms as their male uh, competitors or colleagues or whatever you want to call them. Um, because if the entrepreneurial society is not inclusive, that would mean a loss of resources and an underutilization of talent that would be a waste. And we need everybody desperately. But um, to find a gender gap is not the same as to find proof of discrimination, uh, right? It could be that people make different choices. Um, and you have discussed, and it's an interesting tension also in your, in your whole thesis, uh, you show on the one hand that women make different choices than, than men regarding uh, their life's choices um, and, and reflecting on what they want to do with their lives. And on the other, you suggest uh, or even say explicitly that uh, loan officers and banks are discriminating against women. And of course, you can you can show that you can prove this if you can really control for all these different choices that have been made uh, in the project. So to take the example of uh, chapter uh, three, let me see, yeah, chapter three, and I can specify my question. Um, can we not, um, the, the short question is, can we not interpret your results as indicative of female entrepreneurs making different choices and then these different choices have predictable consequences in, in their, uh, how they fare in the crowdfunding platforms on the one hand and the banking uh, lending channel on the other. Um, you have control for a few things in these uh, in these projects, but not everything. You already showed us an example of lemonade versus walking dogs. Those are two projects. I think a bank loan officer would immediately start to laugh. Um, women choose different types of uh, entrepreneurial ventures. And as a consequence, they may be less interesting to banks to finance. And, and that could that could be because they're female and discriminated against, but it could also be because they come with projects that simply are not bankable. 
and that could in the flip side of that and that's also something i would like to hear your uh, reflections on in a crowdfunding platform um, you have different dynamics obviously um, and it's also a very important addition to the financial system i would say open to other types of activities could it be that, that you're finding that women are more successful because you don't find they're equally successful you find they're more successful than men I, I guess you don't want to argue that crowdfunding platforms are discriminating against men. If they're not, then it's, it's, it's because these women bring projects to the platform that are simply more, let's say, appealing to the crowdfunding investors. Um, could you reflect on this? I listing the point. Thank you for your question. Let me first try to rephrase to make sure that I understood it uh, correctly. The, the essence of your question is uh, whether the story could have the flip side in the sense that what I find to be an advantage for a female entrepreneur to address a crowdfunding platform to obtain funding might be as simple as being a disadvantage for a male entrepreneur to go to a crowdfunding platform to obtain the funding. So in short-sighted, men should go to a bank, women should go to a crowdfunding platform. Okay. That, that's not what I that, what, that's not what I wanted to ask. What I wanted to ask is suppose men make different choices than women. Yes. Uh, yes. Let's not suppose that. That's a fact. <laughs> yes. um, so they choose, let's say, uh, more tech, techy, uh, scalable, okay. large, uh, okay. radical, innovative ventures okay. because they're more attracted to technology. And the female entrepreneurs choose more the. Um, in the personal health care and, and, and coaching sphere and from home because it's easier to combine with, with family, uh, family obligations. If that's the case and, and the, the banks want to fund uh, ventures that they can, you know, they're more used to evaluating and they're also, uh, you know, they have more knowledge of, but also uh, they want to see growth and ambition. Uh, whereas the crowdfunding platforms are more inclined to fund, uh, well, it's easier to find money for uh, protection of panda bears than uh, insects, kind of something like that. So it's a sentimental reasons. Would that not also be a possible explanation for your results? And then the conclusion of that is that there's actually no discrimination. It's, it's by choice. Thank you. Um, certainly, in, in terms of um, the, the availability of the different um, campaigns that are on crowdfunding platforms, um, they go into all types of directions, right? From indeed, like you say, more the technology to the personal choices. And there is a high tendency of female entrepreneurs to, to select into certain types of campaigns and not into others. But nevertheless, as an investor, I have the intention to have a return on my investment. I'm, I'm looking at, at business loans in, in my chapter. Um, if the chapter would have been related to, for example, donations campaigns, so on donation crowdfunding donation platforms, I, I think I, I would agree more with, with the argument. Given here that we're looking at business loans, an investor will still make sure that a rational investor will still make sure that he will have the return, the risk return, which is related to his investment. And this should be the case regardless of whether we're looking at a technology feature or a personal choice or a nail studio for that matter, if, if, if I can take a very blunt extreme example on the other side of the distribution. Um, so I, I, I do not think that that is the core of, of the difference. I do think that the core of the difference, and this is also one of the arguments I give in, in, in the chapter, is that the soft information that an entrepreneur can provide on 
these crowdfunding platforms goes beyond the information that is provided in a normal bank loan setting where you would look hopefully objectively a bank loan officer would look at the business plan and the forecasted earnings and and all other financial aspects this information is also provided on the crowdfunding platform but there is more room for other types of motivations. There is more room to provide a video with the intentions. There is more room to provide a story behind it. And I think in that respect, female entrepreneurs are much better at delivering that additional type of information than, for example, male entrepreneurs are. And that's where their advantage lies in using these crowdfunding platforms. Just then I would suggest, because you were already thinking about follow up projects, right? Um, because what you really want to show is that this is the case all else equal. And what I would worry about, having read your, your chapter on crowdfunding, is there's only, only, only so much you can control for. Have you control for the, for the risk in these ventures? Because you rightfully say, you know, the rate, the return risk is important and not just the return. And what you find is that women get their uh, campaigns done faster and at lower rates. Is this because they're doing campaigns with lower risk on average? Therefore, a lower return is fine and their campaigns are easier filled because they have smaller tickets? Or have you controlled for that? And is it all else equal? We do control for the interest rate. And, and I do not recall having in the conclusions that women earn their money faster and at lower interest rates. In, in that case, the um, <laughs> opposition will be continued by uh, Professor Laurie Curtis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, continue on on the line of conversation that that has just been uh, happening, and it's actually goes right back to the paragraph where you mentioned the um, ability of um, individuals to you know uh, have more of this soft information um, uh, when they're uh, accessing our crowdfunding, but that that sentence continues to say um, that combined. So the soft um, information, but combined with the incentives that the platforms of the platforms to thoroughly screen the loan campaigns they offer, female entrepreneurs are often um, the ones that likely benefit the most from uh, increased information transparency. So my question goes back to, um, are these platform um, individual, uh, whomever is doing this um, uh, uh, investigating on, uh, uh, on the platforms, are they just acting as the bank, uh, as the bank uh, manager first? And then only the uh, female um, entrepreneurs that actually pass that test are getting onto the platform. And so then do you would think necessarily that they would have better um, uh, offers out there and therefore, um, you know, get their um, financing more quickly. So it's, it's, it's basically, um, are the women having to jump through two hoops instead of one hoop at the bank? And you're not, and we're not actually yeah, seeing the women they say no to in these uh, platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, what we see in, in, the chat, in the crowdfunding chapter, and I think this is one of the things that, that I add to the existing literature, we look at three different platforms. And um, these platforms are, are very heterogeneous when it comes to allowing uh, their, their campaigns to be, uh, to be put online. So we have one platform in the platform where we talk about these developing countries entrepreneurs which are campaigns that come from all different countries that end up at the crowdfunding platform, but the crowdfunding platform is merely indeed just a simple platform. They, do, they themselves do, don't do any screening at all. 
Then we have the second platform, the one which is this, this bigger Dutch platform, which is open to entrepreneurs and to individual persons. They do an amount of screening, but it is, you could consider it is quite low. So they will look at whether the individual already, already has some outstanding loans, but it will not go further. And they have no uh, incentives beyond the fact to, to provide uh, a different set of campaigns. They have no incentives to, to make sure, to, to control or to, to, to safeguard whether individuals get too much indebted. Again, private individual or a firm. The third platform, on the other hand, has a very, very extensive screening. So this platform is only reserved to entrepreneurs and small companies. Uh, they will go through extensive screening, they will do on-site visits, they will have an accounting, uh, an accountant check, uh, balance sheets and income statements and all financial figures. So in that respect, we have, so to say, three levels of, of the screening going on. And what we find is that regardless of this level of the screening, the, the female effect is, is present in all three of the platforms. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. And the opposition will be continued by and quite possibly concluded by uh, Professor Mark Delon. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a very concrete question about the third chapter on crowdfunding. Um, in that chapter, you talk, to, you talk about herding. Um, but from what you say in that chapter, it's not entirely clear to me how herding relates to the hypothesis um, that uh, you are testing. And also, I don't fully understand your measure of herding. You say it's the percentage of the loan amount reached in the previous scraping round, but how exactly does that uh, measure herding? So these are my two related questions. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your question. Um, herding is, uh, what, one of the specificities of, of crowdfunding, and we touched upon it a little bit earlier. Um, herding is the behavior of investors to mimic the behavior of other investors. So to say, to, to free ride on the information they think, expect, or the others might actually indeed possess. Um, in that respect, if, uh, imagine we have two totally identical uh, crowdfunding campaigns. Also identical, again, here, disregard the gender aspect. So two identical entrepreneurs, identical amounts, everything, all else equal. But one of these uh, campaigns already has a, a higher amount of pledges than the other one. It is, research has shown that as an investor, I will have a tendency to pledge to that campaign that already has a high amount of funding. Because to me, as an investor, my opportunity costs and my search costs are much lower for that campaign than for the campaign who, at this stage, has a lower amount of pledges. So I will just mimic the behavior of others. And what I do in, in the herding measure that I have in, uh, in the chapter is that we take as a measure for herding the amount of pledges that is already present one round earlier and in our case one round earlier being one minute earlier so we have this scraping information by the minute and the higher amount of money that is pledged will also indicate uh, how much herding has already been going on on that particular campaign you may briefly conclude your reply I hope I have answered your question. You did. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, good to have uh, excellent parents and the and experienced ones. <laughs>
On maternity, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and of your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room.
Homogeneism. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and of your defense. <laughs> In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor de Rip is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, former Labatina Henrika Maria Teunissen, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with a degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Please use the hand microphone provided. <laughs> so I can repeat this. <laughs> Dr. Teunissen, beste for me. Mede namens Anne-Marie, van harte gefeliciteerd met de succesvolle verdediging van je boekschrift. We hebben een hele mooie prestatie geleverd. Ook Jaap. Uh, je moeder, Olivia en Elliot, ook jullie van harte gefeliciteerd. Jullie kunnen hartstikke trots zijn op Pomme. Ja, Pomme, het was, uh, had ik opgezocht, eind 2015, toen je me benaderde met je idee om een proefschrift te gaan schrijven. Met de vraag of ik je wilde begeleiden. Je werkte toen als lecturer bij het finance department en je proefschrift zou gaan over mompreneurs. Ik had er nog nooit van gehoord, maar ik hoefde er toch niet lang over na te denken om te zeggen dat ik het wilde doen. Je was super enthousiast en had hele goede ideeën over een eerste hoofdstuk dat goed aansloot bij mijn eigen vakgebied van de labor economics. En ik zag dat jij als moeder van een tweeling een hele grote affiniteit met het onderwerp had. Juist net van deze proefschrift als jouw eigen onderneming. Maar je had ook al eerder indruk op me gemaakt. Ik heb je denk ik voor het eerst ontmoet toen je nog lecturer was bij AI2. En wat ik me herinner was dat we een keer een etentje hadden met de vakgroep, um, vakgroep Tourné op de eerste verdieping van de Peroen, waarbij jij met heel veel groot gemak over al het onderzoek dat de tafel kwam meepraten. En ik herinner me ook, dat was bij de verdediging of het feestje van de, de promotie van, de, van Ruud Gerards, toen liet je me trots de foto's van de, je kinderen Olivia en Elliot, een stukje kleiner toen, zien, maar je zei ook, dat het je wel leuk leek om weer bij SBI aan de slag te gaan, omdat je toch wel de universitaire wereld miste. Nou, het verbaasde me dan ook niet dat je binnen de kortste tijd werkzaam was bij het Finance Department, waar je hebt ontwikkeld als een van de betere docenten van onze faculteit. Maar als je zelf al geen mompreneur was, dan toch zeker wel een intrapreneur, waar Sanne op gepromoveerd is. Een ondernemende werknemer. Pomme, ik vind het enorm knap hoe jij naast al je onderwijsactiviteiten zo'n fraai proefschrift hebt geschreven. 
met drie hele mooie hoofdstukken die elkaar goed aanvullen. Je toeschrift laat ook goed je kwaliteiten zien voor het doen van multidisciplinair onderzoek. Wat dat betreft was het ook goed bij je dat je nu als affiliated PhD bij het RO eigenlijk bent gepromoveerd met een gezamenlijke tenure track aanstelling bij de departementen Finance en Data Analytics en Digitalization. Bij het schrijven van je papers heb je ook samenwerking gezocht met co-auteurs uit verschillende disciplines, wat een ideale aanpak is voor multidisciplinair onderzoek. Ik heb daarbij ook veel van je geleerd, zeker ook wat betreft het functioneren van crowdfunding platforms voor startende ondernemers. Super interessant. Leuk was ook dat je bij het laatste paper over self-employment en motherhood samenwerkte met Anne-Marie en Kate. Alle drie moeders die het schrijven van een artikel, notabene in COVID-tijd, moesten combineren met de zorg voor hun kinderen. Nou, het is jullie heel goed afgegaan. Hashtag mompower, zoals je zelf schreef in je voorwoord. Je hebt je onderzoek ook heel goed zichtbaar gemaakt op verschillende conferenties. Op het terrein van entrepreneurship, arbeidseconomie, finance en management. En die slaagt er ook altijd erg goed in op die conferenties om je onderzoeksnetwerk verder te versterken. Heel goed gedaan. Maar het was helaas ook een hele zware periode voor je. Vanwege je scheiding, de zorg voor je beide kinderen en vorig jaar het overlijden van je vader, waar je zoveel van hield. Annemarie Anne en ik hebben er heel veel bewondering voor dat je ondanks dit alles je proefschrift hebt weten af te ronden en vandaag met succes hebt verdedigd. Beste Pommen. Je hebt een belangrijk tijdperk in je professionele leven nu met heel veel succes weten af te sluiten. Geniet ervan, dokter Teunissen. Uh, dokter Pommer wou ik al zeggen, maar ik zeg dokter Teunissen. We wensen je heel veel succes in je verdere loopbaan. Dear dokter Teunissen. Also on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you with the honor that you have acquired. I now declare this academic ceremony over. And I would like um, the audience to understand the following. You are kindly requested to leave the room.